Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the patrons on Patreon voted for me to animate the Battle of Mill Springs. If you would like to vote on the next animated battle map, join the Patreon page for as little as $1 and you can cast your ballot. The next poll will contain elements of the Battle of Shiloh for me to animate. Since the fall of 1861, Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston commanded the entire Western Theater of Operations of the Confederacy and placed forces at three main locations in Kentucky to protect Tennessee from invasion. Leonidas Polk controlled Columbus, Kentucky, Johnston himself at Bowling Green, and Felix Zollicoffer at Cumberland Gap. Zollicoffer, a newspaper editor from Nashville with limited military experience except for his time in the Second Seminole War, made an attempt to dislodge Union forces from the mountains of eastern Kentucky that resulted in his defeat at the Battle of Camp Wildcat. He would regroup, fortify the Cumberland Gap, and then invade the Bluegrass State again, this time through Big Creek Gap near Jacksboro, Tennessee, and pushed all the way to the Cumberland River near Logan's Crossroads and Mill Springs. Zollicoffer crossed the Cumberland River with his entire force, endangering his brigade by putting their backs against the river and he had limited boats to ferry his men back across. However, despite the orders from his superiors to move south of the river, he was convinced the position north of the river offered a better defense against the Union forces. His commander, General George B. Crittenden, was tasked with eliminating the Union threat in eastern Kentucky and shoring up the communication lines between East Tennessee and Johnston at Bowling Green. He followed Zollicoffer's path into Kentucky with his division and prepared to launch an attack against a Union force under George Thomas near Somerset. Crittenden, when his force was concentrated just prior to the battle, had around 4,575 men in eight infantry regiments, two independent cavalry regiments, two cavalry battalions, and two artillery batteries. Thomas possessed 4,829 men in seven infantry regiments, three artillery batteries, one cavalry battalion, and a regiment of engineers and mechanics accompanied by Company A of the 38th Ohio Infantry Regiment. It was around 6.10 a.m. on the morning of January 19, 1862, when the two Confederate independent cavalry companies approached the 1st Kentucky Cavalry on the Mill Springs Road. A Union horseman, hearing the sound of stomping horses, yelled out, Who goes there? The answer came in the form of a pistol shot, and the battle officially began. Crittenden wanted a quick strike against the enemy, not an extended battle line like a regular battle. The cavalry engaged one another near a little homestead just west of the road. Zollicoffer, urged on by the sound of gunfire, called up his regiments, the 15th Mississippi in front and the 19th Tennessee behind them. The commander of the 15th sent Company E to the west of the road, and Company G to the east of the road as skirmishers, allowing the cavalry companies to fall back to safety. Private J.B. Foster of Company E remembered, Our company was skirmishing bringing on the battle. Gus McMath fired the first shot of anyone at the Yankees from the 15th Mississippi Regiment, and Dick Wood blazed away a close second. Dick seemed angered and provoked at the Yankees, and is the only man I ever heard talk to them as he fought them. As he shot at them, he bawled, Go back home, you infernal Yankees. We don't want you down here. Go back home, you blue-bellied devils. Another member of the 15th Mississippi explained that the skirmishers were advancing like zouaves by lying down flat and firing, wheeling on their backs and loading again, rising and running forward about 10 steps, and again dropping and firing. The skirmishers pushed back the Union counterparts to the main federal line. At that point, Zollicoffer deployed the 19th Tennessee to the left of the road and the rest of the 15th Mississippi to the right. The cold rain and sleet crashed into the faces of both blue and gray clad troops, slowing down reinforcements to each respective side. Following Crittenden's orders, Zollicoffer moved his men into battle quickly to land a quick attack. He placed the 20th Tennessee behind and to the right of the 15th Mississippi and the 25th Tennessee to the left and behind the 19th Tennessee. The Confederates by this point had successfully overwhelmed the Union through numbers and speed. Colonel John Harlan of the 10th Kentucky later related the following. About daylight, a soldier of Wolford's regiment who was on the picket line dashed into the camp of the 10th Indiana and announced, 
that the rebels were advancing. The principal officers of the 10th Indiana had been up most of the night playing cards and amusing themselves in various ways. Some of them had no doubt been drinking a little, but they were not all intoxicated. Acting Brigadier General Mallon Mason was out of his tent and standing by a headquarters wagon throwing up. He had perhaps mixed his liquors when Wolford's cavalrymen came with the news that the rebels were advancing. Manson immediately ordered the long roll to be sounded. Slowly, much of the Federal force was marching towards the sound of battle. The 10th Indiana was in the lead, with the 4th Kentucky, 2nd Minnesota, and 9th Ohio in the rear. Meanwhile on the battlefield, the companies of the 10th Indiana that were skirmishers consolidated on the east side of the road to confront the Mississippians, since the threat on their right seemed diminished because the woods obscured the southerners' strength and positions. Once the rest of the 10th arrived, they deployed on the west side of the road. Concerned about the buildup of forces on his right flank, Zollicoffer ordered the 25th Tennessee to slide across the road and reinforce the 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee. The Confederates had been slowly advancing since the opening salvos, and now, with their forces concentrated, Union commanders made a forceful push against the rebels. Yankee troops commented on the ineffectiveness of the volleys of the Southerners. Probably due to the age and condition of their weaponry, the Gray Troop's bullets fell short of their target or misfired in the rain and sleet. Zollicoffer could now see the 10th Indiana on his left, and he quickly reversed his decision and sent the 25th Tennessee back across the road. Meanwhile, an artillery battery arrived, and Zollicoffer placed it on a rise overlooking the road. The small Federal force put up a tenacious fight and their weapons were more accurate, causing the 19th Tennessee and 15th Mississippi to lay down on the ground to avoid the hail of lead flying all around them. Crittenden arrived on the field and assessed the situation, ordering the 20th Tennessee to extend Zollicoffer's line to the right in order to flank the Federals. All the while, William Carroll's brigade arrived on the field to reinforce the battle line. On the Rebel left, the cavalry were sent to outflank the Yankees there, and as the Union men attempted to defend their flanks, they realized that they had to fall back, which prompted the 19th Tennessee to give chase. The 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee began their pursuit. It looked like a quick victory, but Zollicoffer and Crittenden knew that there were more Union regiments in the area. The 4th Kentucky made its way down the old road to the Mill Springs Road and halted the 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee. A private in the 4th wrote to his brother that, I tell you there is no fun in fighting. To hear the balls whistling around your head and cutting your clothes off and seeing men fall like hay before the scythe, it will scare a fellow a little. But there is no chance for dodging. All we have to do is trust in God and keep our powder dry. The 25th delivered volleys into the force flank as they attempted to deal with the southerners in their front. But the commander of the 25th became convinced in the dense smoke and pouring down rain that his troops were firing on fellow Confederates and ordered his men to stop firing. This allowed the 4th to keep its attention turned toward the Mississippians and Tennesseans in their front. After being engaged for only a short time, the 25th's commander claimed his men were too disorganized and ordered them to fall back. Likewise, the 4th fell back after a heated exchange. A lull in the battle emerged as both sides assessed the situation. The 10th Indiana arrived back on the field from their trip to get more ammunition and filed in along the force left. Soldiers in the 20th Tennessee remarked that by this time the rain was descending in torrents and our flintlock muskets were in a bad condition and not one in three would fire. The priming in the pans of our muskets became wet and the pieces refused to fire. In this, the enemy had a fearful advantage with their percussion rifles. The 15th moved against the well-protected Kentuckians and Hoosiers, but took heavy casualties in their attempt so they took cover in a ravine. The 25th tried again to attack, but got confused as to who they were shooting at. Zollicoffer likewise, scared they were firing on friends, ordered them to fall back. A series of miscommunications and misidentifications continued to plague the Confederates. The colonel of the 25th told his brigade commander that he thought the 19th was firing on the Mississippians. Zollicoffer rode off to check for himself, the Tennessean passed through his lines and through Union lines to the north. The Yankee troops thought he was one of their own officers based on the white overcoat that many officers on their side wore. 
Zollicoffer, on his way back through the Union lines, realized where he was and was approached by Colonel Speed Fry of the 4th Kentucky. They got side by side of one another so closely that their knees touched. The rebel commander acted calmly and simply stated, We must not shoot our own men. Fry replied, Of course not. I would not do so intentionally. Fry left the general and rode a few paces north when Lieutenant Fogg appeared from behind a large tree and yelled to Zollicoffer that Fry was the enemy and fired at the Union colonel. The shot missed, but the ruse was over. Men from the Federal line began to fire at the Confederate general and his staff. Fry shot Zollicoffer above the left hip, and other bullets hit him until a fatal shot hit him in the left breast, killing him about 20 yards from where he and Fry had talked. It was 9.20 a.m., and Union reinforcements were on their way. Lieutenant Evan Shields saw the general crash onto the damp ground. The young man dismounted, attempted to carry Zollicoffer's body back to the Union lines, but shots rang out from the 4th Kentucky's position, and Shields fell to the ground, wounded in both thighs. Sergeant Major Henry Ewing, who had accompanied Zollicoffer, approached the 19th Tennessee when its Sergeant Major asked him, where was the general? He leaned down and whispered, don't mention it yet, the general is dead. As Zollicoffer approached the 19th's line on his reconnaissance mission, he had ordered them to cease fire, but now the 4th Kentucky and other Union troops were throwing lead into their ranks. Confusion reigned as Colonel Cummings of the 19th Tennessee finally ordered his men to return fire, but it was too late. The Yankee bullets had bloodied the Tennesseans enough to fall back to a safe distance away from the muzzle blasts. To guard against a possible Confederate attack, General George Thomas positioned the 10th Indiana to his right. Crittenden became aware of Zollicoffer's death at about 9.30 a.m., at which point he rode to Colonel Cummings, the senior regimental commander in Zollicoffer's brigade, and put the whole brigade under his command. Crittenden mistakenly assumed that the 15th Mississippi had not been fully engaged that morning and selected them to make a frontal assault in the hopes of breaking the Union line then the rest of the brigade and Carroll's brigade would rush forward and take advantage. In reality, the Mississippians were exhausted from their firefights with the blue troops. Both sides brought up artillery support on either end of the cornfield through which the 15th would attack. The Mississippians stepped out of the ravine with a rebel yell and came under fire from Union artillery on their right. The Southern artillery could not deliver any support because they would be risking hitting their own men. Adjutant James Benford of the 15th Mississippi remembered, Seeing the artillery in the act of firing, I called, Look out, boys, and threw myself first to the ground. I had scarcely hit the ground before a charge of grape shot came whizzing through our ranks and seemed to almost lift Company D off the ground. Several men were killed and wounded by that fire. As I lay on the ground with my sword in my right hand and pistol in my left, a man fell across each arm. I threw my right arm from under the dead and reached over him and picked up my sword, and drew my left arm also from under a dead man, bringing my pistol with it, which I noticed blood running down the barrel. Thomas, sitting on his horse just twenty paces behind the Kentuckians, became concerned about the thick smoke from their rifles that lingered on the battlefield obscuring his men's view and subsequently their aim. He ordered a ceasefire, hoping to commence firing once the obstruction was gone. The Mississippians took advantage of this action by rushing toward the Union line. The two sides clashed in a destructive melee. Lieutenant Colonel Walthall of the 15th saw the futility in attempting to cross the fence and pulled his men back a few paces to deliver some sickening volleys into the Kentuckians, who stepped back themselves because of the deadly projectiles being heaved at them. Walthall waited anxiously for the support promised him in the form of General Carroll's brigade but the 28th Tennessee was still 500 yards away with no order to advance, nor did they even know where their destination lay. Meanwhile, Thomas's reinforcements were arriving. The 2nd Minnesota filed into the left of the 4th Kentucky, and the 9th Ohio went to support the 10th Indiana. Crittenden, seeing the desperate situation in which his Mississippians were in, sent a courier to Colonel Battle of the 20th Tennessee to advance alongside the 15th, the Tennesseans rushed to their comrades' aid. Crittenden ordered the 25th Tennessee to the west side of the road to hopefully halt the approaching Hoosiers who were tenaciously fighting for every inch of the battlefield they advanced across. 
Colonel Battle's men slugged it out with the well-defended men from Minnesota from only a few feet away from one another. One man in the 2nd Minnesota wrote, A comrade was wounded in the head by one of their bayonets while loading his gun. Another had pushed one of their muskets aside while aiming through the fence. Another caught hold of one of their muskets and jerked it through the fence. Two stood and fired at each other, their muskets crossing. Both fell dead. On the Union right, the 10th Indiana pushed both Tennessee regiments to the safety of a fence line and battered them with a hail of lead. The Hoosiers saw the 1st Kentucky Cavalry approaching to their left, and with a renewed vigor to cast away the Tennesseans from the field, both regiments advanced and broke the Confederate line. The Southerners were in complete confusion as their left caved in and their right extended far to the north. Additionally, the Union reinforcements were rapidly approaching. The 12th Kentucky slammed into the 20th Tennessee, making the two Confederate regiments pull back. Additionally, the 1st East Tennessee Infantry trailed close behind the Kentuckians. The Mississippians had fought hard all morning and gave way, scrambling for the rear. The 20th Tennessee began making a gallant stand in the cornfield. To the south, the 9th Ohio approached the 10th Indiana's right flank and held the rebels in check while the reinforcements pushed southward. The disparity in numbers forced the 20th back again, as more and more regiments filed into the cornfield mopping up any stragglers left behind by the gray lines. Eventually, those Tennesseans could take no more and fell back at a rapid pace. To the south, the 9th Ohio shifted their rightmost companies to flank the demoralized rebels and drove them from the field. Thomas's troops did not stop there. They pursued the retreating enemy all the way to their encampment, where the little resistance did nothing to stop the victorious blue troops. The rebels retreated all the way to Tennessee. With one battle, the Union had eliminated the largest Confederate threat in the eastern portion of Kentucky and allowed for them to concentrate their forces against Albert Sidney Johnston and Middle Tennessee. The Union lost 55 men killed and 207 wounded, totaling 262 casualties. The Confederacy lost 148 men killed and 404 wounded, totaling 552 troops. Both sides lost a combined 814 soldiers. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this animation, and I'll see you next time. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian